Cellular Metabolism is the last formal lecture in our lecture series for the unit on newborn screening. In this lecture, we'll cover a series of topics, including a brief introduction to cell metabolism, glycolysis, aerobic cell respiration, and anaerobic cell respiration. To start out this talk, let's first take an overview look at what we're going to accomplish. In essence, the whole purpose of cellular respiration is to take sugar, combine it with oxygen, and ultimately release the following products, CO2, water, and the energy molecule ATP. In order to do this, then, you must provide the cells with the necessary input of oxygen as well as sugar. And where does this oxygen come from? Well, in essence, this is why we breathe. And so in breathing, we put an input of oxygen into the bloodstream. That oxygen then can go to the mitochondria in the cells to combine with the sugar and ultimately produce the energy product as well as the byproduct CO2, which then enters out of the lungs during respiration. And so breathing and cellular respiration are quite interrelated. And how efficient is cellular respiration? Well, I like this slide because it gave a quick comparison um, of the different processes that you may already be familiar with. One, if you simply burn the glucose or the sugar in a biological experiment in a closed container, the energy released from glucose, this is the most optimal as heat and light, this would be considered our benchmark of a 100% optimal reaction. Now in comparison, if we think of a reaction that we're probably all very familiar with, and that's gasoline burning in your car, gasoline energy converted to movement is really only about 25% efficient. And right in between those two, really, is the energy released from glucose uh, banked in ATP. And so burning glucose as part of cellular respiration, and this is the breakdown of glucose combining with oxygen to ultimately release CO2, H2O, or water, and ATP, this is about 40% efficient. Cellular respiration, and this is the key reaction I want you to remember and be familiar with because you will see it again on your exam, uses oxygen and glucose, glucose being a carbohydrate, this is a sugar molecule, to produce carbon dioxide, water, and the energy molecule ATP. So you should be able to recite and write down glucose plus oxygen yields carbon dioxide, water, and ultimately ATP. In the process of cellular respiration, we go back to a little bit of basic chemistry. What we see are, in essence, a number of different redox reaction or reduction and oxidation reactions. Oxidation is the process of losing electrons. Reduction is the process by which we gain electrons. You can remember this if you remember this little phrase, oil rig. Oxidation is losing electrons. Reduction is gaining electrons. And if you see here in our chemical formula of cellular respiration, you see the glucose molecule here ultimately undergoes a loss of hydrogen atoms um, and uh, is um, uh, oxidized down to CO2. And here you see the oxygen molecule uh, is gaining the electrons and is actually reduced to uh, water. So glucose, glucose gives off energy as it is oxidized. So what are the different steps that we'll discuss in terms of cellular respiration? Glucose, being the sugar molecule, undergoes a process called glycolysis. This ultimately results, re results in an intermediate molecule called pyruvic acid. At this point, then, there's a decision-making process, really. In the presence of oxygen, the cell can undergo aerobic respiration, or in the absence of oxygen, the cell will undergo, in some cases, anaerobic uh, uh, respiration. And this does depend on the cell type, and we'll go, on to, uh, go into this a little bit later. For oxygen, or when oxygen is present for aerobic respiration, the pyruvic acid then enters into a transition reaction, followed by the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain, 
ultimately reducing in the production of 38 ATP. On the other hand, if there's no oxygen present and the cell has entered into anaerobic respiration, the pyruvic acid undergoes fermentation, and this results in far fewer uh, ATP produced, somewhere in the order of 2 to 4, depending on the uh, exact mechanism of the process. So let's go through each of these in detail. Again, if we start with a glucose molecule and undergo the first step called glycolysis, what do we get at the end product? Well, glyc uh, glucose ultimately breaks down to a molecule called pyruvic acid. And this occurs in the cytosol or cytoplasm of the cell. And so we see glycolysis in cells that will undergo either aerobic or anaerobic respiration. If I go back to the previous slide just for a second, take a note of where glycolysis is in this process. So glucose uh, is broken down to pyruvic acid through the process of glycolysis, and this occurs uh, in the presence or absence of oxygen. And so here you see what happens is when you're breaking down this glucose molecule, you actually form ATP, and you also form some of these high uh, electron carriers, uh, NAD. And so we'll see these at many different steps as we move through aerobic respiration. So remember, ATP is the ultimate energy molecule that we're trying to achieve in the cell. But these energy care or electron carrier molecules, I should say, are also very important, particularly for aerobic respiration. And so anytime you see NAD which, or, or NADH, uh, think of these uh, electron carrier molecules. So again, if we look at a more detailed step of glycolysis, just to give you an appreciation, though, of what really goes on, I don't want you to remember any of the details uh, about the different intermediates that I'm about to show you, but I do want you to appreciate and understand that although we can represent glycolysis in a very simple format as we did in this slide, it actually is a series of individual metabolic steps, and at each one of these steps there are particular enzymes that are acting on each of these intermediates. In order for the glycolysis to occur, you have to put a little bit of energy in. It takes a little bit of energy in to get some energy out. So two ATPs are put into the system early on, and ultimately we get four ATPs resulting from the system with a net of two ATPs. And so if you look in steps one through three, you, uh, you, a fuel molecule, or glucose in this case, is energized using ATP. Then you have a series of intermediates. Again, these blue arrows are where specific enzymes are acting. And then ultimately, you have a series of redox reactions occurring in which ATP uh, is generated and the pyruvic acid here in the end is produced. So in such a simple uh, step, really, glycolysis is rather simple uh, compared to some of the other ones that we'll study in a minute. But you can see all of the different intermediates that go on in the cell. And so again, you can start to appreciate the number or sheer numbers of reactions that are occurring in the cell uh, at any one given second. Okay, so from glycolysis now, we've broken down glucose to achieve pyruvic acid. And first, let's cover this arm on the left in which the cell can undergo aerobic respiration. And so now the pyruvic acid will undergo a transition reaction, followed by the Krebs cycle, and then the electron transport chain. And so here, again, is just another image of this from glycolysis now. We have a transition reaction, then the Krebs cycle, and lastly, the electron transport chain. You should be familiar with this sequence here, the general outline of aerobic respiration. It will be important for you to be able to remember these four different steps and their correct order. In the transition reaction now, we start out with the pyruvic acid that was generated as a result of glycolysis, and each pyruvic acid molecule now is broken down to form CO2 and another and a two-carbon now acetyl group, which enters into the Krebs cycle. And so we call it the transition reaction. Some people will just merge this right in with the Krebs cycle, but in essence, it really is a separate reaction that's occurring prior to the Krebs cycle. And you need to input this coenzyme A into the system. So pyruvic acid actually interacts with coenzyme A, and it gets this little CoA tag on it, which is what gives you the name acetyl-CoA. 
And so pyruvic acid blending with coenzyme A gives you this two carbon molecule acetyl CoA, which will feed into the Krebs cycle. And now let's go on and study the Krebs cycle in a bit more detail. Where does the Krebs cycle occur? Well, if you remember, glycolysis occurred out in the cytosol. But the Krebs cycle now is occurring inside the mitochondrial matrix. And in the next slide, I'll show you exactly where this in, uh, inner mitochondrial matrix is. In essence, what happens here is, well, you use that two-carbon acetyl-CoA molecule to ultimately interact in a series of intermediates to generate ATP and to generate these electron carrier molecules, NADH and FADH2, as well as generating CO2. Remember, CO2 being a byproduct of aerobic respiration. And here is where I said I would show you where this matrix occurred. If you remember, here's the general structure of the mitochondria. This is the outer mitochondrial membrane. This would be the inner mitochondrial membrane. And inside of those folds, those Christie folds there on the very inside here, this is the inner mitochondrial. This is the matrix. Okay, and so here we said here's the inner membrane. If you look very closely, you can see that um, lipid, uh, bi the bilipid phosphate uh, bilayer, uh, the lipid <laughs> bilayer, uh, and you see that here as well in the outer membrane. Okay, so now we enter into, we generated the acetyl-CoA during that transition cycle. As I had mentioned, this enters into a series of different reactions as part of the Krebs cycle. And really what you're inputting, if you remember, is the acetyl-CoA. You do need to dump in a little bit of, um, of ATP, or ADPs, I should say, uh, plus these phosphate. ADP is not the high-energy carrier molecules. ATP is the high-energy carrier molecules. But you need this sort of precursor in order to make the ATP. And you also sort of dump in some of these electron carriers that aren't fully charged yet. What you get out, importantly, is that byproduct of aerobic respiration, CO2. You also get out some uh, additional ATP molecules. But most importantly, and this is often underappreciated, what you get out of the Krebs cycle is a large number of these high-energy carrier molecules, NADH and FADH2. And I will also make mention that we started out with a six-carbon glucose molecule. You see here what's entering the carbon, uh, the Krebs cycle is a two-carbon acetyl-CoA molecule. We did lose one additional carbon during that transition cycle. So for each molecule of glucose, the Krebs cycle actually will crank around two times. Okay, and so now we've completed glycolysis. We've talked about the transition reaction. We've gone through some of the basic outline of what occurs during the Krebs cycle, again with the entering of the acetyl-CoA molecule, the generation of a small amount of ATP, but mostly the Krebs cycle functions to um, churn out on many of these high electron carrier molecules like NADH and FADH2. And then lastly, what we will discuss is the electron transport chain. Now, in the electron transport chain, um, this is essentially occurring uh, along the inner mitochondrial membrane. What you find is a number of these different protein complexes that work together. These are um, protein complexes that can allow the hydrogen ion to flow across the membrane. And so what happens then is you get these high electron carrier molecules, NADH and FADH2, passing off their electrons these are electrons they obtained during the Krebs cycle to these protein molecules. And it's called the tra electron transport chain because in essence these proteins embedded in the inner mitochondrial membrane transport electrons from one protein to the next. And as they do share or move these electrons, I should say, from one to another, they allow hydrogen atoms to flow across the membrane. And so what you ultimately get is a very high concentration of hydrogen atoms outside of the cell to compare to a much lower concentration of hydrogen atoms inside the cell. And then there's one final protein, ATP synthase, that can take advantage of the energy. Think of this like a dam, really. You have tons and tons, like a, a hydroelectric dam. You have tons and tons of hydrogen atoms out here, and when they flow through this last protein, ATP synthase, it creates an energy such that ADP can be converted to the high energy molecule ATP.
So this is very similar to a hydroelectric dam in which you're controlling water flow, if you will, um, just like we're controlling hydrogens moving through each of these electron transport chain proteins until we have a really high pressure buildup or a really high concentration in our case of hydrogen atoms sitting out here in this inner membrane space. And then when these hydrogen atoms rush through the ATP synthase, they allow for the conversion of ADP to the high energy molecule ATP. And so this is just a different cartoon of the same exact thing, though. Um, oops, excuse me. A uh, different cartoon of the same thing, showing uh, the electron carrier molecules dumping off um, their, their electrons to each of these different proteins as part of the electron transport chain, ultimately resulting in a high concentration uh, of these hydrogen atoms um, outside. And ultimately, these hydrogen atoms then can rush through the ATP synthase to generate um, ATP. Most of the energy a cell harvests during the Krebs cycle is held in energy carriers such as NADH and FADH2. These energy carriers stay within the matrix of the mitochondrion. They transfer their high energy electrons to proteins on the inner membrane of the mitochondrion. The inner mitochondrial membrane separates the matrix from the outer compartment. Large proteins are embedded in the inner membrane. These proteins are the electron carriers in the electron transport chain. The electron carriers are arrayed side by side like the links in a chain. Three of these proteins are ion pumps. NADH transfers two high energy electrons to the first electron carrier, an ion pump. NADH changes to NAD. The carrier protein uses energy from the electrons to pump two hydrogen ions from the matrix into the outer compartment. The electrons are then passed to the next protein in the chain and then on to the third electron carrier. This third protein is also an ion pump. It uses a bit more of the electron's energy to pump two hydrogen ions through the membrane. The electrons shift again to the fourth protein and then on to the fifth protein. This protein is a third ion pump. Using energy from the electrons, the protein pumps two more hydrogen ions into the outer compartment. The two electrons are now much lower in energy. They combine with two hydrogen ions and an oxygen atom. Oxygen, absorbed from the air when you inhale, is the final electron acceptor at the end of the electron transport chain. A molecule of water, H2O, is formed. A similar sequence of events takes place with FADH2. FADH2 transfers electrons to the second ion pump in the chain. The FADH2 is converted to FAD. Hydrogen ions are pumped through the protein into the outer compartment. The electrons shift down to the last protein in the chain. More hydrogen ions are pumped. Again, oxygen serves as the final electron acceptor and a water molecule is formed. Ion pumps are powered by energy from electrons. The ion pumps move hydrogen ions from the matrix into the outer compartment. Hydrogen ions concentrated in the outer compartment represent a form of potential energy, like water held behind a dam. They diffuse back into the mitochondrial matrix through a special protein called ATP synthase. This diffusion of hydrogen ions through the ATP synthase energizes the synthase. This energy is transferred to an ADP molecule forming ATP. This formation of ATP provides the cell with large amounts of usable fuel. So I included that small movie in there to um, give you sort of a different perspective, though, on the same thing that we, we have already talked about regarding the electron transport chain. What I will add at this point is for each glucose molecule that enters cellular respiration, um, the, ultimately this chemiosmotic gradient 
can produce up to 38 ATP molecules per cell. And so this is an important number to remember. Uh, usually when you read most textbooks, you may occasionally see 36 ATP molecules. Most textbooks will say 38 ATP molecules um, as a result of glucose uh, being broken down completely through cellular respiration or through cellular metabolism. And again, just another quick review. You take in nutrients ultimately uh, through some of the other cellular metabolic processes you convert into a glucose molecule. Glucose enters into glycolysis. Glycolysis allows a net production of ATP already, but is not very efficient. At this point then, though, when the cell is undergoing um, cellular respiration, or aerobic respiration, I should say, you then convert pyruvate to acetyl-CoA during the transition reaction. Acetyl-CoA enters into the Krebs cycle to form a lot of electron carrier molecules, including NADH and FADH2. You see, again, a little bit of ATP produced during the Krebs cycle, but the majority of ATP production is occurring as a result of those high-energy electron carrier molecules dumping off their electrons to the proteins in the inner mitochondrial membrane and um, that allows those proteins to then pump hydrogen ions across the membrane, creating that hydroelectric dam type scenario uh, at the point then where those hydrogen atoms rush through the protein ATP synthase, uh, you allow, get um, a fair majority of your ATP produced. Okay, so we essentially cover this whole left-hand arm um, of this uh, outline diagram. Now let's focus our attention a little bit, though, on this right-hand arm. You can see it's quite a bit shorter, and then indeed it is quite a bit simpler. Glucose again gets broken down by glycolysis into pyruvic acid, uh, regardless of whether oxygen is present or not. But if we focus on the situation in which there's no oxygen, and anaerobic respiration will occur. Uh, what you have then is a process uh, known as fermentation. And so here is the process as we outline glucose going to pyruvic acid. In some cells though, um, such as muscle cells, uh, when there is a lack of oxygen now, the cell can convert over into a process known as homolactic fermentation. And in essence then what you get is rather than going through the electron Krebs cycle, I should say, uh, and the electron transport chain, Instead, what you get is lactic acid production um, in, in, in lieu of, uh, or in absence of, I should say, the presence of oxygen. And so this lactic acid production will result in a very small amount of ATP produced, but this is quite minimal compared to what you see or get in an oxygen-rich environment. And so this is the lactic acid that sort of gives you that muscle burn and as you can imagine now at this point when you don't have proper oxygen, you're not getting as much energy, and this is why you start to feel fatigued. Um, similarly, although in uh, slightly different, uh, for other cell types, eukaryotes particularly in yeast, um, now these cells will not operate uh, in an oxygen-rich environment. They always undergo anaerobic respiration. But what you have now is pyruvic acid being broken down uh, to alcohol and CO2. Uh, think of a brewery. This is exactly what they take advantage of in order to make their, uh, their wines and beers, etc. And again, you see a very small amount of energy produced. These are only single cell organisms, though. And so um, anytime that you have a multicellular organism, you can imagine it's necessary to go over to uh, aerobic respiration. But for a simple single cell organism, uh, it's possible to uh, undergo only anaerobic respiration and still maintain life. And here's just a quick uh, couple bullet points regarding fermentation, though. It requires NADH generated by glycolysis. These reactions take place in the cytosol. Um, the yeast produce carbon dioxide and ethanol. Muscle cells ultimately produce lactic acid. And only a few ATP are produced per glucose. Uh, especially in comparison to the number of ATP that it can be produced during aerobic respiration.